Church. I'll ask him to lead us in the invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Shadid if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? And in speaking with Pastor McKee this morning, he informed me that they are now offering Hispanic and uh, American Indian services at their church. Thank you for expanding your reach, Pastor. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning because it is a fact of life that when we wake up in each day, we are faced with opportunities, and every opportunity for us will be one that will shape and develop the lives of those around us as well as our own. And for this council to come together, and these who come before them, looking for ways to better the city, looking for ways to better the lives of our children as they grow, and to give us the confidence to believe, Lord, that in this place, we will not only show love and respect for one another, we will not only show a desire to get along in the work and the ministries that we do, but there will be a desire to honor God. You have said that the nation that honors you will be blessed. I believe that applies to a city as well. And may Oklahoma City experience, through your blessings and through the wisdom that you give these who will make decisions today, we will be a better people. We will acknowledge you and your presence with us. And we will continue each and every day to make certain that in our life and the things we do, others will matter. When we do that, our decisions will be good. For that, we'll offer you the praise for who you are in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call the meeting to order. We begin with a couple of appointments. I'll look for a motion on item 3A and B. Second. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 4 is the Journal of Council Proceedings. 4A is to receive the journal for March 17th. 4B is to approve the journal for March 10th. All right, any comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 5 is revocable permits. I understand item 5A1 uh, needs to be uh, struck from the agenda. Is there a motion to strike? Second. Cast your votes on 5A1. It passed unanimously. 5A2 is a request from... Gatewood Elementary School to hold the Gateway Gator 5K. It's been sanctioned by the U.S. Track and Field Association. And looks like Gina Jones and Leah Anderson are here to give us more information. If you ladies would come forward. And we will need your name and address just for the record. Okay. Hi, my name is Gina James, and I'm a teacher at Gatewood Elementary. This is Leah Anderson, the principal. And the address of our school is 1821. Northwest 21st, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73106. <laughs> Great. And tell us about your event. It is the Gatewood Gator 5K, and it's to continue raising money to transform our playground area. Last year, through our 5K and our Kaboom grant and some other partnerships, like with the Oklahoma City Community Foundation, we've been able to build a playground and put in a track. We're getting soccer goals. We've put in trees. And so this year we're working, um, our main focus is on the pre-K area. So to get them some new playground equipment that's more focused to their um, age, more things that they can play on. We, right. um, we do not have a city park within one mile of the Gatewood neighborhood. And so we're kind of trying to make our playground a city park um, and inviting the families um, to join in for healthy lifestyles and as well as our students, of course, at Gatewood. Wonderful. Well, thank you for doing that. It's in Ward 6, Meg. It's, it's been so nice to see how the neighborhoods, and, and not just Gatewood, but yes. Plaza District and exactly. Crescent and Pan have all rallied around to yes. make that playground really a special place for the neighborhood. So thank you so much. Thank you. I move approval of the event. All right. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you and good thank luck. You. Item 583 is from 8th and H to hold the 8th and H Night Market. Anyone here representing this organization today? Yeah, come on forward. Saturday. Let's get an update on 8th and H. Good morning. Um, we're gearing up for, uh, uh, my name's Brian Bergman. Live at 625 Northwest 22nd, uh, Mesta Park. 
and uh, we're gearing up for our first H and eighth of this of this season. Um, we'll be going for nine months again. We'll go from March until October. Um, our footprint will be roughly the same as it's been in the past, from Sixth Street until 10th, to Tenth Street on Hudson. Um, we're actually in, we're involving a whole lot more of the neighbors. That way, we can kind of relieve some of the congestion of all the people because we've just, you know, our biggest our biggest adventure in this whole thing is that every year we we anticipate growth and it keeps out it keeps exceeding our expectations. So we're trying to continue growing in a in a healthy and sustainable way. So that's kind of our goal and including more of our neighbors and, and spreading out to the rest of the city as well. So that'll be March 27th. All right, and that's the final Friday of each month, mm -hmm. uh, continuing now and through October. Mm -hmm. And so this, this Friday is a week from Friday. Friday. This, this Friday, Friday, Friday the 27th, 27th is the final Friday of the month. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Mary, there are a couple of extra things attached to it this particular right. Friday. Um, right. It's the uh, official opening of the OCU Law School. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to have food trucks and things yeah. um, surrounding their campus. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a new event um, that Allison Barta Bailey's been working on called yeah. Industrial Flea. It's going to be a two-day um, kind of right. flea market. I don't want to call it in Oklahoma. We call it a yeah. swap meet from time to time, but yeah. um, mm -hmm. a, a kind of a, a very fun flea market. That's also going to be a new event. So. Yeah. Um, and I looked at the list. How many food trucks do you have? Um, right now, we have right at 30 trucks. Mm -hmm. But then we also have, there will be more at Industry Flea, and there will be more at Blue Garden, and there will also be some at OCU. So that way, again, with, 40, with, with the crowd that we've had in that small space, mm -hmm. we've tried to figure out ways that we can diversify and kind of give that crowd away a little bit. Because the goal is we want people, uh, one of the things we learned last year that we were really excited about that I think you guys would find interesting um, a lot of the restaurants in the area would call us and they would let me know that that's their biggest night of the month. That's always a huge bump in their business. And we'd have, we'd have phone calls from Paseo, from Plaza, from, from Deep Deuce, from Uptown, from Downtown, from all over the place, saying that they've got a big bump in the crowd. And they're never sure if we're going to be excited about that or not. And we actually are really excited about it because the whole goal of it is we want people to come out. Like, it doesn't have to be our four blocks. It doesn't have to be our thing. The, the thing is we want, it, we want people to come downtown. We want people to have something great to do. We want it to be a good excuse to come out and bump into people. Something that we're struggling with a little bit and we're working with Public Works and is yeah. keeping people safe as yeah. they're walking across all those intersections. Now yeah. that we've got this development on the north side of 10th Street, mm -hmm. people are kind of moving back and forth between Blue Garden and Right. In H and Eighth, and so right. we're talking about making that. I also, if I could, just recognize Drew and our staff. This has been a challenging event, and yeah, absolutely. Um, I really appreciate all of the work that our staff yep. has done. Yeah. Putting something this massive together is hard. It takes a lot of cooperation. So thanks, yeah. Drew. Really yeah. appreciate it. I'd move. Okay. okay. Is there a second? second? All right. Cast your votes. And item five A three passes unanimously. Thanks and good luck. Continuing with our Ward 6 festivals theme, the OK Garden Fest is going to uh, host the OKC Garden Festival on May 9th. Is there anyone here representing this organization? Oh, right. see, Thank you. This is, yeah, I'd make a motion to approve. This is over at the um, Farmer's Market, which should be mm -hmm. just great fun. So. Second. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 5A5 is a request from Tierra Media to host the Ready Gazette Go Festival. And Bill and Linda are here. Bill, you're going to come up and speak? Good morning. I'm Bill morning. Bleakley, uh, 3701 North Chartel. Uh, this year, Oklahoma Gazette is putting on its inaugural uh, health and fitness festival in Myriad Gardens. It will be this Saturday with beautiful springtime weather in the 70s and no rain. Uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting event. We've got some major providers of uh, fitness endeavors in town uh, to provide instruction and activities uh, in the uh, west end of Myriad Gardens. We've got some uh, healthy food trucks lined up to provide some uh, good things. Whole Foods is doing a cooking demonstration. Uh, we've got the uh, uh, river folks with their rowing machines. We've got Pilates and yoga and uh, you name it, uh, instructions going on so the public can come down and, and experience these things and pick out a new fitness routine. Uh, Bill, the Gazette's had stuff going on since January, haven't you? You've had 
Yes. Uh, well, that. we've had a self-evaluation program going on where you can uh, monitor your own physical activities and uh, create a level of uh, performance, and we acknowledge that with a certificate down at the event. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Great. Invite you all to come down and and uh, do a little Pilates or something. Move the pill. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. We're voting on item 8A5. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Good luck. Thanks. Item 6 is request for uncontested continuances. <clears throat> Mayor, just a couple on page 13. Under item 9G1, item B, 3512 Steele Avenue. We ask that that be stricken. The owner has removed. And item F, 1533 Southwest 41st. We ask that that be stricken. Again, the owner has removed. And then under item 9H1, Item C, 517 Harvest Trail, we ask that that be stricken, the owner has secured. And then on item 911, uh, uh, item C, 517 Harvest Trail, again, we ask that that one be stricken because the owner is now secured. Any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, let's recess the council meeting. Convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are three items. All right, comments or questions on the MFA? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Adjourn the OC MFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority. Five items here. All right, comments or questions on the PPA? I, I have a question on D. Yeah. Uh, the, um, how much total are we, are we putting in? And, you know, I remember there being a phased approach of the, of the softball facility, what, what is the total um, number of, the, of? The total budget? Yes. Do you know that? 20. You know, there, 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 there was a, uh, mm -hmm. James, I don't want to get, yes, no, you, Dennis yeah, Bowers yeah. and Eric Winger can come up and Tom Anderson have been working on that closer than I have. We had uh, two phases that were completed last year and then the second phase this year. And then we've got a third phase that will be funded with the future geo bond issue. Okay. And the two phases that are completed, I think, are in the six million dollar range, I think, and and then the uh, uh, future phase for the, the actually the adding more more seating up there in the next few years um, was over ten uh, or fifteen. Okay. I, yeah. and this I'm, item here is a private sector, you know, gift. Yes, on, based yeah. on naming rights. Yeah, yeah. no, it's I, another I, I part of the funding. Eric, I'm guessing the numbers, and he just shook his head, and, and he's he's not sure either. Well, yeah, I'll better we'll get back to you on uh, on that. Any other questions about PPA? Do we have a motion? Yes, All right, we do. Then cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, just the claims and payroll today. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with the consent docket. All right, are there any individual considerations? No, I, I had a couple of things, um, 7G, 7I, and uh, 7K. Okay. Go ahead and get started, man. Alrighty, great. Um, I just uh, wanted to recognize um, in item uh, 7G the um, acceptance of a $1,000 grant with the um, American Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and this was to um, actually provide uh, the dollars for one of our employees, it was a scholarship essentially, for one of our employees to attend their uh, animal welfare conference in Dallas, which is always a good idea for our folks to get additional continuing education. All right. um, item um, 7I is um, the, uh, also a resolution that um, reallocates some dollars from community development block grants and from the SNI initiative to create a um, small economic development loan fund for microenterprises. It's a small lending program um, in the areas uh, touched by um, our CDBG uh, footprint. And I think it's just a wonderful opportunity that will allow just a, a small lending program and small businesses um, within our commercial district revitalization programs to apply. Okay, and then item K? And then item K. I'll be as quick as I can. This is a really awesome opportunity. I just wanted to kind of make sure that the development community was aware of. Um, the City of Oklahoma City is declaring 
surplus uh, four tracts of property uh, along 10th Street uh, between North Ellison and North Blackwelder. And you may remember that this was property that the city um, uh, acquired when we did the work on 10th Street and expanded the width of it. And, mm -hmm. Uh, north side of the street, um, we're putting out an RFP for interested parties to look at one block, two blocks, three blocks, or all four. Um, it's very specific in how it can be developed. You can't pick block one and block four. Right. Um, they have to be contiguous blocks. Are we looking at mixed use, or do you have any idea? We are. We're, we're really looking at um, a broad range of things. Mixed mm -hmm. use would be preferable, but, but it could be single family housing all the way up to commercial. So we're looking for developers. We're looking for developers to take a look at this. The the value that we've that we've appraised the property, um, and the value is actually extremely reasonable. It's a complicated site to develop because the utilities are on the other side of the street, and so um, I think in terms of you know what we're um, hoping to be able to offer, it is in the value of the property. Mm -hmm. um, but our planning department's been working on this very hard, and it's a, it's a very exciting site and could really enhance what's going on in Class and 10 Penn. It's on the south end. Absolutely. Of class Continuing and 10 the Penn. growth so of the city in the west, uh, 10th Street's a good and project. Really encourage folks to take a look at the RFP and um, see if they can come up with some creative projects. And Ian's been working on this really hard. Is there anything, Ian, that I missed? But, well, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity, so I hope we'll get some great results. Yeah. Mayor, I'd also ask David Todd to talk to us for a minute this morning uh, about item Z, and it's an amendment to the uh, implementation plan with the school trust. And as we're wrapping up, we're, we're having some additional excess funds, if you will, that we're reprogramming. Uh, the program implementation plan, plan was adopted, I think, in 02, and it's been modified just a couple of times, and to modify the plan, it has to go to the city council, to the school board, and to the school trust, and it's, it's a three-step process. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that we had the plans and they were well thought through and, and, and implemented. So, David? Thank you, Mr. Couch. Um, as, as Mr. Couch said, this is program implementation plan <coughs> amendment. And I've just got a, a quick little little presentation here for you. You know, we're getting close to the end of the Maps for Kids program. And, <coughs> um, so, so we're taking this excess money and, and doing some things here. So uh, the last update on, on this implementation plan was January of 2015, and that was the what they call the BYOD program, the Bring Your Own Device program, that the school district is putting together for the high schools right now, so that uh, kids can bring iPads and, and work off their iPhones. So that was the last one we did. This update contains two changes, and it's Chavez Elementary and Moon Elementary. Um, Chavez Elementary here on the on the left is a little over four million, and Moon is a little over one and a half million. Um, Chavez was, uh, they, they left it out of the, the bond program inadvertently for a gymnasium. It, it, it just got left out. So what this uh, project will do is add some classrooms and it'll add a gymnasium at, at Chavez. And then uh, Moon was in the program originally and then it was scheduled to be closed and was taken out of the, the program. And as you know, it's, it's still open, and there's a lot of things to be done at Moon. So uh, with the work that the school district's doing and what we can do, we think we can make a difference out there. <clears throat> so as far as status, we have 68 schools that are complete, 45 early start roofing and fire alarm projects. We have five schools that are under construction right now. And as far as uh, projects still to be done that is on the original program, we have the administration building, and that, that is it. <clears throat> Here's the list of, <clears throat> pardon me, all the... Schools that we have completed, I'm obviously not going to read all those, but you can see that there's a substantial list. Other completed projects were uh, bus fleet replacement, and, and you've seen this before, but you can see all the IT work. So this money that, that we have identified for these two projects came mostly out of IT savings because we were able to bundle uh, computers. Instead of buying one school worth of computers, we bought 10 schools worth of computers at the same time. And, and over the course of all these years, we've saved a lot of money. <clears throat> so the schools that are under construction right now is Taft Middle School, and that one is very close to being complete. We expect a, a, a final acceptance within uh, 30 days or so. Emerson Alternative Edition is also pretty much in the, in the same state. 
there's two projects going on at Emerson. There's the uh, renovation and the clinic also, but the addition is, uh, is 95, 99% complete right now. They're just doing some cleanup things. The uh, renovation is, is, I don't know, about a third of the way through. So it's, it's still going, but yes, Emerson has turned out really well. There's a fire suppression project still at Northeast Academy, and there's a paving project at Columbus at Jackson, and both of those are more than halfway complete. And then, as I said a while ago, the remaining project is the administration building. So this implementation plan asks for Chavez and Elementary as additional projects. And if I highlight a couple other things. One, there were additional things done to Moon. Moon was done, uh, some other improvements have been done by the school district early on. And the other thing is that this is the MAPS for Kids program. This is the 2001 program that was voted on uh, by the voters with the bond issue at that time and, and the sales tax at that time. We are currently still administering some projects for the school district from their 07 bond issue. And so there are some gymnasiums going on, a lot of gymnasiums going on throughout the district. And so we are still working toward that. We're kind of like a contractor for the school district to, 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 to get those projects built. And so that's all we're working on with Maps for Kids is what David's pointed out. But, but his office is still doing other projects for the school district. Okay. Yeah. Um, hey. Do you have, we have an update on what the status is on the administration building. Um, are they going to use the one old central bank building? Or? I, I believe that they are. I, I, I think they're still trying to work through uh, what, what they're program. trying to do. Um, I think um, I know that they've uh, visited some other facilities and, and have, uh, I think, embraced an open office concept. And so I don't think they can get all their, their people in, in, into that building, but I think between that and a couple of other things that they've got working, they'll be able to uh, get out of the class uh, facility in the next year or so. The, um, Not the class, the client yeah, facility. Yeah. Um, what's, where are we with regard to the overall budget? I understand we're in budget, but these are projects that are added on because these two today are added on because of savings. Where does it look like we'll be? when the projects that are currently scheduled leaving the administration building off because that might take up any money. Is that the plan? <clears throat> well, yeah, there's, there's money set aside for the administration building that was uh -huh. always there. And the projects that are ongoing are, are within budget. Um, there might be a little bit left over as those complete, but we should be fine as far as what we're supposed to do there. Okay. This is actually programming some additional money that we had left over right. and the school district identified well, this as their primary. I guess my question is they're in such a, uh, a bind with regard to schools in South Oklahoma City, especially Southwest Oklahoma City. They're just hugely under, under uh, uh, built in with regard to the number of schools they need. And I'm just wondering if there was a possibility that any money be left out of all these projects to help them to help at least start another <coughs> facility someplace. Probably more in Meg's ward than it is the uh, mine, but it's uh, in the Heronville, Columbus. I know they, there's a plan, or there's been conversation about reopening Columbus, mm -hmm. which is uh, probably should have never been closed. But, uh, we have a history. I went to a high school that, or a school that they closed one time. They should have. I understand <laughs> that. <laughs> the good news, Pete, is we're at least getting some additional classrooms at Chavez, which were severely needed with this project. Well, I know they're going to have a bond issue soon, and we ought, you know, ought, ought to make sure that we get as much done as we can, because how the performance of their last bond issue and of Mass for Kids are going to have a great deal to do with how successful they are when they go out for bonds the next time. And we need to be on top of that, because they sorely need more classroom space. And I'm glad that you all are talking about classroom space. Um, uh, about a month ago, I had the opportunity to go to Chavez uh, again and, and to see kids learning uh, in the hallway, desk in the hallway, and, and to see kids learning in the stairway uh, where you had maybe six desks uh, in the stairway, kids trying to learn. Um, that was definitely uh, sad to see. So I'm definitely glad we'll be able to uh, figure something out for us, uh, Chavez, and uh, as it relates to Moon. Thank you. 
um, um, for your your hard work because I know originally um, Moon was uh, a part of the um, uh, Maps for Kids and then they decided to close Moon and they decided to keep Moon open but without the necessary resources. So I want to personally thank you for working with us uh, on, on trying to get improvements done to, uh, to Moon. Uh, during spring break, I had the opportunity to drive by Moon uh, and to see some of the improvements that the school district um, put in place. And there's still yet work to be done, but I just wanted to personally uh, thank you because, as you remember, a couple of years ago, uh, when I helped my town hall meeting on MAPS, MAPS 3, MAPS for Kids, you know, Moon was an issue uh, that was brought up uh, time after time. So I just want to personally uh, thank you. Matter of fact, that town hall meeting was actually David Todd's wedding anniversary, <laughs> uh, but he he came on out uh, anyway. So I just again want to thank you for your hard work as it relates to, to Chavez and uh, Moon. Okay. David, thank you. Thanks. Ready to vote the consent docket? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Moves us on to the concurrence docket. All right, any individual considerations here? Looks like 14 items on the concurrence docket. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And now we're on to item nine. These are items that require a separate vote. We begin with a series of zoning cases. The first two are in Ward 7. The first one is at 2501 East Memorial Road. It's currently involved in a couple of planned unit developments, and it would become a new PUD if approved. John? All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Madam Clerk, has anyone signed up? I see that the applicant uh, is present. Uh, and first of all, I just want to thank uh, the applicant, which uh, is Oklahoma Christian uh, University. Uh, thank you all for uh, everything that you do for our city. A lot of people believe that Oklahoma Christian uh, University is in Edmond because you all have an Edmond address. Uh, but however, it is within the city limits of uh, Oklahoma City. And so I just want to again thank you uh, and thank uh, again o Oklahoma Christian University for everything that you do uh, for our, our community. And since you all are already at the podium, I was going to actually go ahead and move for approval. Uh, but I, I just want, since you all are here, uh, can you explain uh, the future growth of Oklahoma Christian University? Okay, sure, Mr. Pettis. I'm Bill Collins. I'm an attorney. I represent the university, and I have with me Stephen Eck, who's vice president and general counsel. Uh, the current zoning was in place, uh, what, 20 years ago or so? Uh, the university has evolved quite a bit, uh, mostly in conformance with the old zoning, some not quite, uh, but this is an update. Uh, there is a critical need for housing for the university. Uh, the university is, back up, Teal Ridge Manor, which is the high-rise independent living uh, for senior citizens, uh, is owned by the university and it's being phased out as independent living and moving students into it, but we don't have the zoning for it. So the primary purpose for the application is to address the critical need for housing for students. Uh, the university has been a victim of its own success. Uh, it's got about 2,500 students now, undergrad and, and graduate students, and it's out of room uh, to, house, to house the students who, who live on campus. So. The critical issue is to, is to address the housing. Now, we've also uh, done some other things by way of this zoning to make more space available for future growth uh, by shortening the setbacks that are pretty extraordinary now and, uh, and allowing a little extra height. Uh, but it, it's just an update. And uh, university plans to continue to grow. Uh, 3,000 students are, is not an unreasonable number for the foreseeable future, and who knows after that. Uh, but at any rate, this old plan uh, that wasn't been in, that's been in effect for some 20 years just needs some, some tweaking and some updating and to get it more consistent with what's actually on the ground and, and plan for future growth. All right. Thank you. And with that said, I move for approval. All right. We're voting on item 9A1. Cast your votes. Unanimous. I appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen uh, and 
Ms. Sire, uh, we have a current application for building permit, and one of the holdups is, is the zoning. So if we could, could we have the emergency, please? I move for I move the emergency. Second. All right. We have a motion on it. Thank you very much. Cast your votes, and it passes six to one. Yes. Okay. Um, it, but there were only seven lights up there. Yeah, I don't think his light was on. Yeah, his light was on. Oh, oh it was Ed's two. that wasn't on. Okay, so it was six to two. The emergency passes six to. It needs seven for many votes to pass. Okay. An emergency vote needs seven, so the emergency did not pass. All right, we're on to item 9A2. This is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 10400 Northeast 150th Street. It's currently AA Agricultural, and it would become a new plan unit development. John? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Has uh, anyone signed up? No one signed up. Uh, I move for approval. The Planning Commission uh, did uh, approve, so I move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A2. There's no comments or questions on this item. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Item 9A3 is a zoning case in Ward 5 at 12205 Southwestern Avenue. It's currently AA Agricultural, and it become a new simplified planning and development. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Francis, anyone sign no, up? Sir. Okay. Uh, is the applicant here? Would you please come forward? Uh, this was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. There's no protest. And just for my personal clarification, you're proposing to add five new buildings with a total number of units to be added of 40. Is that correct? Yes, Jason Spencer with Craft and Tall on behalf of the applicant. Uh, that is correct. That's what's uh, uh, spelled out in the, P in the SPD. That would be the maximum added. So it's just a continuation of the traditions at Westmore there. Yeah, and I, I believe it's been very well accepted by the, uh, the residents and, and the community in total. Uh, so I, I recommend approval. All right. We're voting on item 9A3. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Item 9B is a request for a drainage easement in Ward 8. Is there anyone here hoping to speak on item 9B1 today? How about a motion then on item 9B1? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 9B2 is to close a portion of 52nd Street. This is to help out the Omniplex. All right. No? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do see uh, the director of the uh, Omniplex uh, present. Um, the Planning Commission approved. And again, this will, uh, this plan uh, actually uh, allows the closing of the street and also uh, allows for the uh, correct um, platen, uh did I say that word right? Yeah. Um, it allows for the uh, correct um, plot uh, to be to be done because they still are under the the old one, and so this will actually bring it up to date and also close out uh, Northeast Fifty uh, Second Street. And uh, you all have requested uh, emergency because uh, the simple fact they are currently under construction. And they did not uh, realize uh, at the time um, that <clears throat> that was under the, the old, that was uh, platted way back in 19, the old plat um, it was still in effect. So um, with that said, I am going to move for approval, and then I'm going to make another motion um, for uh, the emergency. All right, this is a motion on item 9B2 that would benefit the Science Museum I, of I Oklahoma. Got, I got a question. It, yeah. So this isn't closing the street in between the museum and the zoo, right? It's not. It's closing the street in front it, of the museum. But, right, right. Like a street that's not Right, and, and, and basically what they are doing is that they, they're closing that street uh, and making um, where people come in off of Remington Place stood up on 52nd Street because what happens, uh, people turn with turn on 52nd uh, and go straight down and it, it causes a major uh, uh, traffic jam 
So now uh, they want to bring the traffic off of Remington where they can come straight into uh, the Omniplex uh, parking and it splits up uh, the zoo parking and it splits up uh, 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 the Omniplex parking. So, because a lot of times people go through uh, 52nd to try to get to the zoo. And so now it, 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 it basically was set up where you come in, if, if you're coming in for the Omniplex, you're coming in from, you come into the Omniplex, you, you want to go to the zoo, then you'll be able to go to the zoo through the other uh, entrance. Uh, and also they have uh, changed the, the entrance um, to the building, because right now the building uh, entrance is further uh, on, kind of closer to uh, Martin Luther King. Now they've moved the entrance way uh, closer uh, to where you see the drive, the, the, the drive in. Uh, so it, it just, uh, and matter of fact, I'm going to allow the director, the, the police, come up and uh, further explain. Thank you, Mr. Pettis. I'm, I'm Don Otto, uh, director of the Science Museum. Uh, I live at uh, 14517 Oakmont Road, Edmond, Oklahoma, 73013. Uh, we indeed are, uh, are requesting to close 52nd Street for two reasons. One, the convenience of visitors, but two, the safety issue because of what Mr. Pettis says, the, the traffic that's there, and it isn't always uh, safe traffic. We have lots of families with strollers and little kids trying to get across that street. Uh, what we are in, in fact doing is, is uh, requesting to turn 52nd Street into a pedestrian way from MLK to the education building at the zoo. So the zoo and the museum, pedestrian-wise, will actually be connected completely uh, on what is now 52nd Street. So uh, uh, the street has already been pretty much abandoned, I guess, in front of the zoo, and we're requesting to continue that on over to Martin Luther King Avenue. And Don, this is a project that you've been working on for at least 10 years, <laughs> maybe more than that, in terms of redoing the entry of the building, a new facade, opening up the visibility of the museum. We're about 75% uh, of the way through a $23 million improvement to the Science Museum, uh, all private funding. Uh, it'll include a 20,000 square foot exhibit for families with younger children that I think will extend the visit to the museum by four to six additional hours, which is a good thing. Plus moving the entrance to the central location in the building and redoing all of the parking, landscaping, adding trees, all of those, uh, and, and improving the facade of the building, as you know, our building isn't the most handsome in the, in the world, so we're making it look more interesting on the outside to reflect what we think is important going on on the inside. Congratulations so, on getting that all accomplished. It's a huge step. So, so to clarify, there's not going to be that 50-second entrance to the there parking lot. There will not be the 50-second so entrance. There will become a pedestrian way. The bus pick up and drop off for school children will will come from 50th along the west side of our building, and they actually will be parking on the west side of the building for buses during normal times. Certainly in May, that won't work, because we'll get 60 to 70 school buses at a time show up, right. because everybody waits until May. But uh, uh, during most times, we'll have plenty of bus parking on the west side of the building. Uh, during peak times, they will park at the south end of Remington Park parking lots. And, but we're trying, we are endeavoring to separate the bus parking and bus ingress, egress from the automobile traffic because they don't mix very well. Well, they mix too well sometimes. <laughs> and so th there will be one entrance to the museum off of Remington Place and one entrance to the zoo off of Remington Place, or is there just going to be one total? There is, there is one for each of the, the museum and the zoo from Remington Place. We also have a secondary entrance into the, par into the museum's parking space from MLK. It, it's moved farther north, or farther, yeah, north from where it is now at 52nd Street. But there will be an, another entrance into the parking from Martin Luther King. But the primary entrance that we will be, and, and we'll have the ability to close that off during slower times. but. Um, uh, the primary entrance will be off Remington Place. Okay. All right. John, you have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All right. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. John, you have a motion on the emergency. The, uh, emergency. Is there a second? Yeah. Look, wait, wait. Look, look, before we vote, let me, let me, I want to talk about my concern about the emergency. And I'm going to vote for this one, I think. 
My concern is the emergency clause is put in to give the public an opportunity to argue against it if they feel aggrieved by it. It has a purpose. Emergency clause cuts off that appeal time if anybody has one. In the future, for any of you that want my vote on the emergency, you need to tell me why they're supposed to, why this is different than any other case. I'm not going to vote for any more of them that have a protest. If there's a single protester, I'm not going to vote for the emergency. I just want to, I'm, this is a better op, good opportunity as I have to talk to all of you and tell you what I'm thinking. If there is a reason for this emergency or any emergency other than I'm in a hurry, that's not a, that's not good enough to convince me to vote for the emergency. But if there's a reason, I just like to hear it. I don't want to be voting against all the emergency just because somebody moves seconds and we vote on it and no, we don't know why. If there's a valid reason for it, I'm in on that. But I'm not in on it being just a way to shorten the process and cut the public's access to an appeal off. So if you, if before we vote, if somebody can give me a reason for an emergency, you might get one today. If not, I'm not going to vote for it. Dennis Box, on behalf of the applicant, I've got an excellent reason in this case. This case will have to go to the district court. We'll file a petition. Uh, by voting for the emergency, you allow us to file the petition immediately. We will give notice to the public. Anybody that uh, might have had their rights uh, taken away will have those rights over in the district court. It will just speed up the process that they will have those same rights. So this, so this, has, this, this case has to go to district court before it could be finalized anyway, so there's going to be another notice. That is correct. Okay. And, and I do also want to uh, thank the director who did uh, reach out and met with uh, the Neighborhood Association about this. Uh, they have had a, a very long um, positive relationship with the neighborhood, and the neighborhood uh, does not have any concerns. So, uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I am asking for the emergency in addition to what uh, Mr. Box stated. That's good. All I, all I ask before we vote on emergencies is to have somebody to have a reason other than I'm in a hurry. That's, that's your problem, not mine. And that's your problem, not the public's. But if you have a good reason like the one you've given and the fact there's going to be notice, that's fine. I just thought this was a good opportunity to clear, clarify sure. it because there may have been a reason the last time, but the thing was done before I had a chance to do anything. I don't want to be against the progress. What I do, I've said it again. I know I've said it. <laughs> well, I just I want to. I echo. saw the mayor smiling at me, and I knew he thought I was going to say it again. <laughs> I want to echo. I, I find Councilman White's um, arguments persuasive. It took me about four years to, but I'm. I guess I'll vote for this one because of the explanation given. But I'm unlikely to vote for any emergency absent a threat to public health or public security, which is what I think the clause was designed for. So just. I have nothing against, the, as I vote against these from here on out, I have nothing against a potential applicant, but it'll just be, it's very unlikely that I'll vote for an emergency from here forward. Okay. All right, we're voting on the emergency. It's item 9B2. Cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. We're on to item 9C, and this is item is hip for final hearing. This is a fee adjustment on our parks. We held a public uh, hearing last week. Did anyone show up today hoping to speak on item 9C? All right, how about a motion? Is there a second? All right, cast your votes on 9C, and it passes unanimously. And item 9D is a companion item to 9C. This just kind of moves it forward. Is there a motion on 9D? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9E is a, a bond sale that took place this morning, hopefully about 45 minutes ago. Is there any word yet? I, I got a text on it, and, and there is word, but we need a few more minutes. So we can okay. put that later on in the agenda. We've got seven bids, and they came in very good for us, but, but uh, we're not quite ready yet. All right, we'll come back to item 9E then. Move on to item 9F, and this is, uh, well, this is, is this connected to the 9E? It is indeed. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to 9F as well. Item 9G is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9G? All right, how about a motion? Is there a second? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9H is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9H? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes on 9H, and it passes unanimously. Item 9I is a public hearing regarding abandoned buildings. Is there anyone here hoping to speak or any item listed under 9I? All right, how about a motion? Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. 
Item 9J uh, is a presentation from Eric Winger. Eric's going to come in and talk to us about uh, some street lighting policy. Street policy, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Sure. I apologize for the delay. There are a uh, few changes today that I'd like to present with the city street lighting policy update. I think uh, if you've had a chance to read the memo, you'll find that the original policy was actually put in place back in 1980. So there's obviously been a significant number of changes just in the lighting fixture types um, that we use across the city. <clears throat> Get my couple of notes here. There are a uh, One more minute. I'm almost there. So one of the biggest issues that the, the old policy did not address and some of the things that have come to the council most recently is in regard to mid-block lighting. And so if you look at the old policy, what it provided for is that in intersections that exceeded 600 feet, intersection to intersection, specifically in residential neighborhoods, it provided for one mid-block light to be installed. One of the biggest issues is, is that if intersections exceeded 600 feet, it didn't provide for a second or a third light. And so one of the biggest revisions that we're making in this policy is that the 600-foot spacing is still in place and it still provides for mid-block lighting, but you're going to see that we actually can provide for additional lighting under the policy with 300 foot minimum and 220 foot maximum spacings. And so for example, if only one light could have been provided before, if you look at multiple intersections, intersections that now go from 600 to 659 feet, we can install one mid-block light. At 660 to 879 feet, we can now install two, three, four, five, and so on as the intersection lengths increase. We actually have a number of intersections in Oklahoma City that exceed 1,000 feet. And so they obviously merit one or more additional mid-block lights. This new policy takes care of that. The other things that are in the policy is that it does reduce um, and actually eliminate the actual fixtures. One of the biggest things that's coming to our attention, OG&E is now studying LED lighting. But there are different types of LED lights. And so instead of having specifics on types of lights that will be installed, we're leaving that very open for new technologies. And then we actually hope to see some LED lighting opportunities in Oklahoma City here in the very near future. Um, the last item that I'll mention that's included is we have reduced the financial limitation that was in the old policy. The old policy had a 5% annual cap on increase for lighting. There are a couple of issues that have come. Um, the first is, is that um, we actually um, have different rate increases from the electric utilities that can sometimes exceed that 5% limitation without adding new infrastructure. The other is that we actually deal with our utility companies and we use credits and other methods of payment now that don't conform to the old policy. But you know, what I'll update is that we're going to be financially responsible and, and fiscally responsible for future updates. And as we look at new lighting installations in Oklahoma City, we're working very, very closely with other city departments, including budget and finance, ensuring that those funds are in place for any new lighting that's approved by the city council. So with those changes, those are really the three largest items that we've changed, the mid-block lighting being one of the most significant, um, reducing and eliminating the fixture types so that we can make way for new technologies, and then also that final one that we've got that capacity that if funding is available that we can proceed with new projects. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Eric, has og &E provided us with a new inventory of available lighting, or is that by eliminating it? I mean, you, you really are allowing for um, future technology but have we updated even on an interim basis what we can use? So we have not. OG&E actually provides us different lighting fixtures through their tariff, and so it's not really a part of the city's street lighting policy that those lights are provided. It may have been back in 1980, but now they're, they're listing and giving us opportunities for new lights. For street lighting, there really only are two light types that OG&E is able to provide. But with the LED, they're talking about providing up to five different light types with the new LED technology. We think that once those are received by the city and, and reviewed and approved, that's going to be the wave of the future, but we're going to keep that very open. For example, um, there is an LED pilot project on Southwest 15th Street, um, just west of Interstate 44. 
It has five different or six different LED types that have been studied for the past couple of years, but even those LED technologies of two or three years ago are updated with newer technologies today. Um, they're able to control the colors of lights better. Um, they're able to even reduce some of the maintenance and some of the other issues that were in the early LED technologies. So we just want to keep that open so that we can take advantage of whatever the latest technology is that OG&E or OEC or Canadian. Um, we, we also have three companies, but the other companies can provide as well. That was going to be my follow on us. Can we acquire lighting from other companies? This policy would apply to all street lighting in Oklahoma City, so we would use the same policy with OEC and Canadian Valley Electric. And I'm extremely grateful for the attention to the mid-block mid lighting. You know, that's been a neighborhood issue for a long time. And uh, there'll be folks that are, I think, knocking at our doors anxious to um, improve some neighborhood lighting. So with the council's approval today, we would be able to receive new mid-block mid -block lighting requests, actually approve those, and start those installations with OG&E in the future. All right. Eric, thank you. How about a motion, then, on this resolution? Mayor, uh -huh. I'd, I'd like to ask Eric a question. Um, is there a lighting policy in the rural areas? The reason I ask is because you arrive in the rural area and you'll find a light. And then you go two or three miles and you won't find any lights. You'll find intersections that are highly traveled with lights and without lights. And um, I don't know whether that's that way in other uh, people that have a lot of, councilmen have a lot of rural areas, but that's the way it is in mine. It, it appears there's no real pattern or no and I just uh, wonder if, if there is one, and if, if there isn't one, shouldn't we look at one? People in rural areas are really the, on, the, on the far edges of the argument about lighting. There are those that think they need the light. They, you see pole lights at every house, practically. But then you, you also have the people that think that lighting is pollution and it destroys the value of living in a rural area. So it's a real dichotomy, but at the intersections, it seems to me, that we ought to have some kind of policy because there are some fairly well-traveled intersections even in the rural areas. So this policy does not address rural lighting specifically. Um, it does have the residential as a part of the policy, um, but it doesn't differentiate, say, between suburban residential and rural residential. So I would say that rural residential would be a candidate for this policy, but not specifically street lighting. Right. We can definitely look at that. I think that some of the issues that we may run into is some times the availability of electricity on maybe some of our rural intersections, and, but absolutely, we could look at that. Right. Um, I'm also anticipating there may be some other things that will come up, say, in the next year. We may not want to wait 30 years for the next lighting policy update. You know, we may want to do it on a more regular basis. Well, I'd just like to see something, some kind of report or something that looks at it. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not advocating it necessarily okay. because of what I said. There's people on both sides of that argument. People want them and people hate them. Uh, in rural areas, that may be true in residential areas too, but not, probably not quite as dramatically as it is in rural areas. OG&E offers a, a really unique opportunity for private owners, and so this doesn't, you know, the policy does not address private security lighting, but as you mentioned, there are a lot of pole lights that are located at residences at the request of the property owner. Right. OG&E has a, has a whole separate program to install lights right. individually. Um, that's actually a very cost-effective solution for security lighting, and um, you know, they can purchase a number of lights. So Genie makes the installation. It's incorporated into their monthly bill. You know, we could probably update a little bit more on, on what that is if there's an interest. That, as well. that is a good, I, I have three old lights myself. So I, I, I know, but I'm really uh, focused on the intersection. We're not mid-mile. We'll be happy to look at that. Yeah, let me look at that. It seems some of them are, are fairly unsafe because they're so dark. Okay, All right. All right, we have a motion and a second on 9J. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Item 9K, understand we do not need executive session. Do not. Okay. Right. We have the, the motion is to approve the resolution. Okay, cast your votes on 9K. The resolution passes. Item 9L, I'll ask the council if they'd like to have executive session on this item. We, all we need to do is pass the resolution if you'd like. Okay. Say, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And that puts us on to 9M. And I understand we do need executive session on 9M? Yes, sir. All right. Is there a motion to move item 9M into executive session? All right, cast your votes. Item 9M is into executive session. Item 9N, I understand we do not need executive session, so a motion to strike would be in order. Cast your votes on 9M. That item is struck from the agenda. 
Item 9-0 is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9-0? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Looks like we have the results of our bond sale. Is that right? Craig, come on up. Really we, good timing, Craig. Yeah, we skipped item 9-E and F on the agenda earlier. Craig, give us an update on the sale that took place this morning. We did have our bond sale this morning for $85,595,000. We received seven proposals. The low bidder was Robert W. Baird & Company at 2.665966. That's our second lowest bid. The lowest bid two years ago was like 2.662. And so it's a very good bid for us, uh, very pleased. The next lowest bidder was at 2.71, so very tight. The highest bidder was at 2.87. Um, so it's a very good bid for us, and uh, we're really excited about it. Moody's and Standard & Poor's have looked at this again. We did this just a few weeks ago when we talked about our, um, when we talked about the uh, refunding, had, had the refunding item before you. The Moody's and Standard & Poor's have looked at us and reconfirmed our AAA bond rating. When they come with a new bond issue, they do a, a reassessment and, again, have confirmed the AAA bond rating. Um, I do want to recognize they aren't with us right now because they're down, still finishing up some work, but our financial advisors from PFM, Dennis Whaley and Jennifer Arnold are with us, and then our bond counsel, uh, John Michael Williams and Gary Bush. I uh, appreciate their work. And then Kenny Sudel is our assistant finance director and debt manager, and then um, Joanna McSpadden is also, she's a budget specialist, but also works on our debt program, so I appreciate all their work on this. Um, it's very good for the city, and it's a, it's a great bond sale. All right. Craig, thank you. We need a, a, a motion on item 9E and F. How about a motion on item 9E first? Move the item. Second. All right. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. And then on item 9F is the companion item. Move the item. Second. All right. Cast your votes. Pass unanimously. Thanks, Craig. Your Honor, I would like to say, in light of the uh, pending, uh, or at least the speculation of increased interest rates, again, it's a very very uh, impressive uh, rate that we were able to achieve on this bond issue. So, thank you. I believe, Francis, we need to make sure that we have the, the uh, emergency on that. Good luck Good with luck. that. So. Yeah. Yeah. This one we need Why do you need the emergency, bond, Greg? To be able to, yes. Why do you need the emergency? The emergency is so that they can get the bonds. So they, they've actually got deals to sell the bonds where they complete the deals. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, cast your votes on the emergency. Passed unanimously. All right, items from council. James, you have anything? All right, Ed. I wanted to, to ask some questions. I see we have some personnel from MSA, and I just wanted to follow up. I'm sorry for the disjointed nature of asking these questions today, because I, I know there was an MSA presentation, or a fire in MSA. My understanding was that that was going to be at the end of February, and then for whatever reason it got rescheduled when, unfortunately, I couldn't be here. But Jim Couch asked a very important question about Level Zero, and I just uh, I watched the proceedings, and I, I'm left with some questions. So I just like, I think someone from FIRE is going to keep Chief Bryant's not, not in town, but I think Chief Clay maybe. I think Chief Clay was supposed to be here. Let me see if we can round him up. So just, just. There he is. Ah, uh, thanks. So. I, I just have some questions, but just as background, I mean, if, we, if we'll go back to November of 2013 is when we switched from one provider, Paramedics Plus, to AMR. And AMR underbid Paramedics Plus by some $50 million over, over five years, and there was concern at the time about really a couple of things, that maybe, you know, maybe this, the, 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 the environment in the private sector is getting so intense. Uh, Paramedics Plus underbid AMR in Alameda County in California by a similar amount, and maybe this was, you know, a similar kind of payback, or that there was some, and there were concerns about, you know, how could you underbid Paramedics Plus, who's been doing it for all these years by 50 million, uh, without cutting back personnel, without um, decreasing the amount of uh, services to the city, and that that might be reflected in things like level zero, which is and not having ambulances available at, at any particular time or response times. And so we went, we've gotten, this is really the first time we've talked about it since that switch. And we went about a year, we were hitting the numbers, and then for the first time 
that I think first time in modern history, they didn't hit their numbers in terms of response time. And so there was a, a large fine levied um, against AMR. That's, that's a significant event. And that was for December and January, I believe. Then uh, Lacey Lowry from Channel 9 was listening to our, our department's broadcast and heard, overheard that we were at level zero. She inquired, what, what is this level zero business, and did a story about level zero, in which uh, this, the title of the story was Oklahoma City Flu Cases Causing Ambulance Shortages. And Jim Wenham, the MSA Director of Clinical Services, said, even though it might sound scary, it changes very, very quick, because if we're at a hospital, they might may just be dropping a patient off, but they're still available to run calls. And Lacey Lowry ends the, the story saying, the general public would never know about the level zero status because IMSA is still making it to every call in the required response time. Just shortly after that, IMSA, in a meeting with our, our chief's blocker, who's our EMS chief in Staniland, asked us, requested us to stop using level zero over when we're broadcasting that because the media had picked up on that. And for whatever reason, they made a request of us to stop saying level zero, which my understanding is we said no. I mean, we might say there are no ambulances available, but we're not going to stop telling the, the fire department that we're at level zero. The reason being that fire, our department responds to all level one priority life-threatening calls, but not the other ones. Unless we're at level zero, which means that there's no ambulances available at a particular time, and therefore we have to then change our policy and respond to all calls, uh, priority two on down. And so last week, when I, when I listened to, to MSA CEO Williamson, he said that this is really, he didn't say anything about the flu, which, which left me confused, because that's what the story said. It was about the flu, the spike in flu cases. Last week, there was no mention of the flu. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and so what he said is that there was a challenge in December or January and that this is a national issue related to the number of paramedics, that uh, the issue is solved. We're excited about the future. We've increased the number of paramedics. We had some other local providers who, who's, who took some of our paramedics. But this is a national problem with the curriculum. They can go a little longer and be a nurse. So now AMR is giving signing bonuses and shift differentials. And, uh, and that that will help solve the situation. Um, so with that, let me, let me just ask you, let me ask you some questions and clarification. How, how many, I think one, one question I have is how many incidents of level zero have we had since November of 13 when we changed providers? Uh, we've had 132. This is from our records, tracking it as a fire department. We started tracking these things after November 1st of 2013. We've had 132 incidents of level zero. Okay. So and what, what is that's IMSA's term, obviously. It's not our term. So, so that's, that's a time that IMSA tells us that we're at level zero. So you've been notified by IMSA that we're at level zero. Uh, we requested that through some meetings with uh, IMSA personnel that we wanted to start knowing when they were at level zero. So, as you stated, we could know why we're responding on lower level calls. And uh, that's the situation that came up is that they were supposed to notify me originally, being the Dep Deputy Chief of Operations, or Chief Stanland, who is directly over dispatch. They at first, we had issues a little bit with uh, getting the notifications, and uh, so we started requesting. I requested of the personnel in the field that if they find out they're at level zero or whatever, that they would contact our dispatch and confirm that so that we could put that out to the rest of the uh, stations or the crews responding that IMSA is at level zero, meaning that well, from what we understand of that, that they have no ambulances to respond at the time. So, it, so it's 100, what's the number? 100? 132 incidents since November of uh, 2013. So, that's, so we're, at, we're at a year and a half, so that's roughly about every four days we're at level zero. And the average duration that we're at level zero is, is how long? Uh, on average, it's two and a half hours. Sometimes it'll be a little longer than that, sometimes it'll be uh, you know, 
shorter. As, as you'd say, there's times that it's maybe 20 minutes or something, and, and that would probably go in hand with they have someone that's at a facility dropping a patient off and, and can get right back, but they're, they're notifying us. So if, you, if you've got some incidents that are 20 minutes and your average is two and a half hours, that stands to reason that you've got some times that you've four and five hours. We have documented, uh, Chief Stanland's documented this from the reports from our field personnel. He does have a spreadsheet that has, has those incidents on there. So Williamson last week was, was very clear that, that some of us may have heard this number of two and a half hours, but that's just simply not true. Is, I mean, I would, so there's a discrepancy in what we're hearing last week and this week. As far as our factual information that we've collected, that would be the average. So they, they tell you when they're going on level zero, and then they tell you when you're off level zero, and the average Correct. of that number is two and a half hours. And some of the time, uh, there may be some incidents where they have forgot to notify us. Uh, we have a few of those. I mean, so you have, they've notified, they haven't notified us that they went off a of level zero, which could be understandable. Some, yeah. that, that was my next question, is that you've got, you've got some times where they're at level zero, but you weren't notified, so the number could actually be larger. I think you have at least six, six times that you know of. Our dispatchers are sitting next to their dispatchers. We know they're at level zero, but we never got the official. I don't know what the exact number on that would be, but there are, there are times that, that they, uh, they were either very busy and couldn't notify us. Most of the times that these occur from, from looking at the report, the re because we asked them to give us a reason why they're at level zero. And most of them are uh, obviously larger call volume, they're busy busier than they would normally expect on that particular day or whatever. But that's, I mean, we, we, did you want to ask a question? Well, I was just going to say that I picked up on that, saying that there was a, there was a, a lack of communication on this issue between the, the, the fire department and, and, and EMSA. And so after the last week's meeting, I asked uh, Chief Barry if he would be an interface between the, the fire department and EMSA to try to try to work that issue out. Okay. So I did hear that, and I, I have asked. I asked Chief Barry to be involved in that issue last week. So. Perfect. Thank you. I will say over the last couple of years, within the last two years, that we've had a lot better relationship with, with the EMS providers and stuff. And have, we have meetings on uh, a pretty regular basis to discuss issues. And, and these things come up, you know, hey, you're at level zero, let us know. Is there something? Because we, we all want to work together to provide the best service we can. How many, do you have a sense for how many, how many calls we've made on lower priority calls because they're at level zero that ordinarily we wouldn't make? I have that number. It's over that period of time. It's, uh, we made about 59,000 EMS calls for that period through our, LF, uh, our leading for results database. And during that time, we made 688 uh, calls to low lower priority calls that weren't level one calls that we would normally go on. Are we compensated in any way for making those? I mean, I know that in Tulsa, I think there was a, there, maybe they were paid $50 every time they were there first fire or we, uh, when, are we compensated in any way? And when, and when AMR is fined, where does that money go? Does it go back to the taxpayers, to the taxing jurisdictions, or does it go to MSA? I don't know exactly where that money goes because there's only been one time that I know they've been fined and we I can, aren't compensated. I don't know if I can answer that. And the answer goes, it goes back to the EMSA, into the EMSA organization, which we are a beneficiary of. So it doesn't go back for any, uh, any payback to the fire department or so, but it does go back into the, the EMSA. And so if there's there, uh, uh, inflow of cash, we would be a beneficiary of, of that. But we're, it's the Oklahoma City taxpayers that are, clear, are making up the shortfall. I mean, we're, it's our gasoline, it's our wear and tear on our engines, it's our, we're going out on calls that we wouldn't ordinarily go because they're, because of a surge or whatever, they're, they have no ambulances available some six, seven hundred times. Could, could I ask a question, yeah. Ed, if you don't mind? Yeah. I just, going back to Paramedics Plus, I mean, did we have level zero incidents at that time? I'm I, certain I just, we did, but I can't, I don't have those numbers, so I don't have the facts on that. Uh, but this, 
I think this has happened in the past. And I'm just trying to get some history as if this is a brand new situation or if we've, I, you know, over years. I don't want to speak for Emsa, but, it, but it's a complex issue. And we, and we changed the criteria when we changed the contract. And I think that's right. a factor that's in there, too. I think there's a factor of the startup issue that, that, that came forward, as, as Steve indicated last week. I think there are problems within the, the, the industry uh, that they're having problems getting paramedics because the training has uh, become uh, higher levels of training, and, and, and a lot of people that go through that training can do a little bit more training and become a nurse. So I think there's some issues that, along those lines. I think there's a lot of factors that come in, but it's still something that needs to be addressed. That doesn't mean that it's a, a, a zero level is acceptable, and we need to, to work toward minimizing those occurrences. But I, can, I know that level zero did occur. I had to think Meg's exactly right. I mean, we need a historical reference. I mean, the, the impression that I got watching it last week was this was an issue in December and January. But the issue, but it's a, it's clearly, you're having level zero throughout the 18 months. Just in the time that I've been meeting with Chief Bryant trying to track this, it does appear like it's accelerating in the last three months. I, I met with him, but again, we thought that Williamson was coming in February. I met with Chief Bryant and getting prepared for that, and it was, we were at 99. Now we're at 100 and 132. So I mean, it, it would appear that, that it's accelerating, and I think that's the concern. So we need some historical reference. What happened under Paramedics Plus? And again, they had two less minutes than, than we do now. But is this accelerating? Is this? Um, the bottom line is that Williamson told us that the problem solved. We're excited about the future. We've hired new people. This isn't going to be a problem. So we have a budget presentation from fire in May. Would there be any reason we couldn't have Mr. Williamson come back in two, three months and give us, just check in with us and let us know that everything is still okay and we're hitting our numbers? And we can certainly get an update on that, absolutely. Okay. But tell me about, about the mutual aid situation. I, my understanding when Williamson was going to come in February and said we were going to have fire chiefs from other municipalities here, is there some concern about this, the mutual aid being used to, to hit some of these numbers. We're seeing Midwest City ambulances in far southwest Oklahoma City. In Mustang, I think the fire chief said, we're seeing Tuttle ambulances as much as IMSA. What, do you, can you tell me anything about the, has there been a spike in mutual aid? Just to go back for historical benefit, we didn't, you know, the reason that we started tracking a lot of these things were because we came over under a new system, as Mr. Couch said, and we wanted to see how it affected the overall system. We weren't aware of a lot of, that there may be a mutual aid issue, so we haven't been tracking that. I can't speak to facts on how many times uh, that IMSA has a, another ambulance service uh, come in for mutual aid, but I do know that from talking to our crews, uh, that it's happened more often than it ever did in the past. I can't quantify that because I don't have the facts on it. We haven't been tracking it. But you, you have how many paramedics in the fire department? We have uh, 37 engine companies at 36 different stations. Out of all those uh, engine companies, 31 of them are paramedic or ALS engines. We try to keep two paramedics at each one of those ALS engine companies. We have approximately 215 paramedics in our department. Now, all of those, some of those work in the training division that provide EMS training and uh, in other uh, sections, work sections that we that deal with EMS, but with, we, we have around 215. Well, they okay. come up and go down as we hire rookie classes uh, we try to hire paramedics. We're just like any other, like the, they say, it is difficult to find paramedics, uh, and especially cross-trained or people that want to cross-train as paramedics uh, and firefighters. But are you are you having problems with turnover? Or are you having problems retaining paramedics? We do not have an issue with turnover in the fire department. As you know, it's uh, it's a career. Most of our, our folks. That's what makes our departments one of the best departments in the nation. The best, in my opinion, is because of our people. It's not something that you get into and leave. Almost everyone in our department works at least 20, 25, 30 years, so we don't have an issue with turnover. Occasionally, we'll have paramedics that uh, 
would request to go to a uh, less busy uh, station because you know they're experiencing a lot of uh, calls but uh, generally not even that so if we have someone that is getting to the point that they need a little bit of a break from the from the paramedic uh, calls we'll move them to a slower paramedic station but so, so when we're hearing that it's a nationwide problem retaining paramedics that we have all these turnover issues and that's leading to some level zero issues that's not it's not a public sector it's not an Oklahoma City Fire Department issue it's a AMR private sector I would issue. say it's a paramedic service issue it's not a fire department uh, paramedic service issue in other okay. words the paramedic firefighters are not going to leave their job over over that whereas a paramedic may in turn get a little more education and move on into a higher level of medical field okay well I really appreciate the clarification and, and I again I just hope that we can revisit this in two to three months this is we're not just talking about taxpayer dollars we're talking about public health response times um, and if everything is solved and, and not a problem as Williamson told us last week then I'm sure in two to three months and six months and 12 months from now uh, they'll be hitting all the numbers and and uh, but I, I would like to revisit it I, I personally would like to be present when Mr. Williamson comes each and every time I'm, I'm not gone that often and it's well known in advance when I am gone so I'd like to be present thank you Pete, you want to say something? Yeah, I do. I, I'm um, uh, at the. I'm more concerned about the service, the, the degradation. If there is a degradation of service, what is it? As opposed to uh, the number. I, I would say I'm not a numbers guy, and then somebody'd say, "Well, what are you?" And I wouldn't have any answer for that. So, uh, but the the number stuff doesn't. Uh, I'm not as a, uh, moved by it as I am. Um, uh, what is that? What? How do those numbers translate into the quality of service, either by fire, by IMSA, by whatever? I mean, we're, we, what we're, our responsibility is is to is to respond to our citizens' need for emergency health care. Um, if going to zero has a has a uh, perceivable, uh, either numerically or emotionally. Um, uh, impact on the quality of health care then I'm then I'm interested uh, the, the just how many times that this happens or how many times that happens um, is not all that significant to me um, so when you come back I'd like to have if if this I mean, there's enough comment here about it that um, I'd like to know is there an impact on health care is there some is this computation of how many times we go to zero does it has it made a, a difference in health care I mean it, health care costs money like everything else and um, obviously the fire department has doesn't have turnover in paramedics I mean in my view the true definition of mental illness would be somebody that leaves the fire department before they've been there long enough to retire I mean that 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 goes without saying I mean <laughs> so um, I, I'm more interested in how it affects people. If I had a heart attack today, I want to know is is how how would it affect me, or how, what what's the if we got want to talk about numbers. I want to get them down to bodies. I want to get them down to people. I want to get them down to Larry and me and everybody else around this horseshoe and all the seventy thousand people I represent. Um, obviously, by throwing money at it, there is there is a way to do it. There is a way to make response times better. Everybody can have their own ambulance and their own driver. That'd be real quick response time. But we're not going to do that. Because health care costs money just like every other service we deliver. And I want it translated back to the impact on the health care outcomes. So, so what, what outcome measure should we use? I have no idea. But I mean, we talk, we talk about response times being related to outcomes. I, mean, here's so the, I think here's the bottom line. You're never going to know. There is no, we have cardiac outcomes. Right? How many people die from a heart attack? And that's measurable. But the person who's lying there with a broken hip or a broken femur who has to sit there for an extra two or three minutes, you're never going to be able to measure that. The, the most, most of this is imperceptible to the public. They're, they come home, somebody's laying on the floor, their beloved one, they call the ambulance. The, the 
fire is getting there 60% of the time first, so it's usually fire that gets there. If they get there at six minutes versus four minutes, or nine minutes versus six minutes, is they can't tell the difference. But we know that the brain without oxygen, every single minute that's going by, is, is doing more damage. There's more neurologic damage with a stroke. I mean, there's, you, but you are never going to be able to get specific outcome measures that nail it down. And that's why the best that we have is how fast. That's why fire, what, what Chief Brian talked about last time is how many times fire's getting there at the seven minute mark and we're not hitting our mark. We want to be there 70% of the time. We're only getting there 58% of the time. And so it's, that's the, that's the best measurable objective data that we have because the other stuff is imperceptible and it's not being measured. And three months from now, we'll, we won't have access to that data. Uh, and so that, that to me is the concern. If fire, with, with this level zero, and with these fires on time response, uh, on scene time has now increased two minutes, right? Correct. So fire's having to sit with a patient for an additional two minutes before they can hand it over to EMSA and then they can go on to the next one. Do you know, I mean, do you know today what the response time is of the fire department who we're relying on to get to priority one calls 60% of the time first? What the response time is during these level zero incidents? I know overall what our, it's probably increased our response time in some of these situations two minutes, but you can't, we can't have that. We can't have the fire department who's getting there first getting there two minutes later if it's a heart attack or there's lack of oxygen to the body. You can't, two minutes is too much. And you may not see it in the numbers and it may be very difficult, but we, we just know that two minutes for the first responder is unacceptable. And that, that's what I'm asking that we look at um, if, if they come back or two to, three, two to three months. If there's another outcome measure that is quantifiable, I, I'm all about looking at that. But I don't know of one. All right, Larry, do you have anything today? <laughs> uh, yes, I do, Your Honor. Uh, just for the briefing of the council to bring you up to, to date on some things, uh, I happen to be the chairman of the IMSA board, and I serve at the uh, request of the mayor and the city because we are to have an advocate on the board to ensure the quality of service since we have a very vested interest in the, the MSA level of service. Uh, that being said, I find it kind of interesting that through all this dialogue, uh, no one has approached me from either the, from the, the city or the fire department about concerns over the level of service. Your MSA board meets once a month. The last Wednesday of every month, we meet tomorrow, uh, as a matter of fact. That is a public meeting that anybody can attend one of the things that we do every meeting is review the operating results of what is going on in the field. I happen to be privileged, having read the, uh, the uh, agenda, to know that uh, we are in compliance, EMSA is in compliance, or AMR is in compliance, I'll get it down right. AMR is in compliance on response rates uh, during, the last, during the month of February. Uh, the response rates call for us to be uh, there within the prescribed time, 90% of the time, the figure is 91% of the time for the month of February. So the getting to the scene, now, where did the response times come from? The response times did not come from throwing a dart at a dartboard. They came as a result of a study that the Medical Control Board, which is the authority that tells EMSA what the protocols and responses have to be, in order to give the citizen the desired level of service. The Medical Control Board are the ones based on a study by the University of Oklahoma, not influenced by EMSA at all, came up with this are the response times that are needed to provide the level of service that the citizen deserves out there in an emergency situation. The system was put together that fire was to be the first responder to every call and they were to administer whatever uh, treatment that they could administer during that first call. 
EMSA was a part of the system to come along and transport, to continue the care and to transport that individual to a local hospital. The local hospitals are a part of that system to be able to expeditiously take the uh, patient when he or she is brought to the emergency room and to, to continue the treatment. The final results are that the EMSA system that is in place right now is the envy of fire and emergency and hospital service nationwide. Our response rates to cardiac address, our, our, our cardiac arrests are the uh, second best in the United States. Now, with that being said, uh, I think there is a need to bring and Jim uh, a meeting together of the different parties and discuss some of these issues with the facts. We have MSIP people here. I'm not sure this is the right place to do that. But uh, if you have a concern, a citizen out there, about the level of service in Oklahoma City that EMSA is providing, I wish you'd dial 761-6555. That's my cell phone number. That's what I'm charged to do, to be the conduit there, because I don't think there's this problem. But if there is, the EMSA people are here. They're committed to solving it. The AMR people are considering to, uh, are con uh, are, uh, con uh, are wanting to solve it also. And I think it's not as bad as some of the figures that you're talking about. Were we ever at level zero? Yes. Is that a problem today? Is level zero a problem today? It's getting much better, sir. You're absolutely right. There we are right there. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thanks. Pete, anything from items from council? All right, David. Well, just to keep this topic on uh, for a little bit longer, uh, one of the nice things about springtime is, is the weather, but it soon turns into a more violent type weather as we go, especially into April and May. But uh, just wanted to state, uh, having been through emergency training last year with Councilman Ryan, uh, I know that our uh, fire police and all of our emergency responders do a great job the school systems, both the uh, school district of Moore and Oklahoma City, continue to work with our fire departments in, in preparing for emergencies and disasters. And uh, I don't want to be too over optimistic, but it's, it's really a good feeling to see how well prepared our city is for any possible disasters. And we just have to be aware that as we move into the month of April and especially May, uh, storm season does really heighten and uh, those opportunities for tornadoes especially we may have to change ward five to something like tornado alley uh just to uh, uh to take advantage of that um, and hopefully we won't have any like we did last year but uh, history tends to uh, show us that we do often have problems and like chief clay heads up the urban search and uh can you, the, what? Urban search and rescue. Yes, urban search and rescue. They do a tremendous job. They're continuing to train uh, year round. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to mention that to our citizens that uh, unfortunately it's a problem we have to deal with, but the city is very well prepared. Thank you. All right. Okay, so I'm going to change the subject. I want to congratulate the, uh, all the partners that participated in Open Streets. Uh, on Sunday, we had somewhere between 25 and 30,000 people um, on Northwest 23rd Street between uh, Robinson and Western. Um, it, it was a great event. People were on bikes and skates, and there were dogs. And I finally found out what pickleball is. I mean, they were playing pickleball on the street and chess games. And it was just, it was a wonderful um, event. And it dovetailed with uh, the second thing I'd like to mention, which is to thank OU and the uh, Institute for Quality Communities fantastic day yesterday down in Norman mm -hmm. um, talking about placemaking. I, I felt like it really built on what we did last year and didn't just talk about place, but actually, you know, talked about health and economic drivers and investor focuses and parking issues. And it really kind of stretched uh, the concepts that we talked about. And uh, the luncheon speaker was the uh, former parks director from Bogota, Colombia. Wonderful speaker. and. Um, they started years ago this open streets idea. Our project on Sunday was 0.8 of a mile. And in Bogota, every Sunday and every holiday, they have 80 miles of streets closed and only available for walking, biking, skating, 
Um, it's an amazing uh, project, and he's going to be here actually tomorrow. He's here all week, and he's going to be here uh, speaking to um, some of our staff uh, on Wednesday to vision what this might look like five years out and ten years out. But um, you know, he, he did a history of of ancient cities and how they all developed their street patterns developed from walking paths, obviously, because that's what we do. We're called pedestrians, and uh, he at the end of the presentation, he had a great um, slide that said every single city ought to have a two-sentence, a two-word rule, and it's pedestrians first. It was really interesting, but great program. Great. John? All right. City manager reports. Uh, we're going to start out with a presentation by uh, Jeffrey Gustin from S2O, and we've got some uh, progress reports on the uh, it's not the why the River Sport Rapids project. That's hard for me to get out. River Sports Rapids. Jeffrey, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. I'm going to give you a quick update on where we are with the uh, Whitewater project. Um, starting off, I'm just going to walk you through uh, kind of a current timeline of the activities to date. We're roughly about 33, 35% through our contract with the extensions of uh, change orders um, one through five. The, uh, the, the latest change orders being the addition of the two river light pole foundations as well as the uh, kayak building on the east side of the site. So we're about 35% through our contract. If you look at the, uh, the progress uh, chart here, it's a little misnomer. There's a lot of bars up at the top going 100%. Those are early bond or mobilization bond and uh, early uh, mobilization issues. Uh, for the most part, utilities are about 75 to 80 percent. Buildings are in the 10 to 15 percent range, and obviously the focus has been on the dirt and the concrete, which is about 35 percent on the channels itself. This is an overview uh, picture that was taken about 40 days ago, posted in the Oklahoman. It does a good job of uh, just giving you a big, broad picture of what's going on with the site, and you can see all the gray stuff. That's the concrete and uh, all the dirt, and uh, you're going to see that for quite some time yet. Uh, most of the work, again, it started in the lower pool, uh, bottom pool for the whitewater course, and is working east to west. And uh, you'll see the um, red area just above that. It's a fifth street. That is all the import that's coming in to fill the course as it works its way back to the east. And then the pump station as well to the east. I'll get a little more detail for you here uh, following. On the pump station, again, working from east to west, this is essentially where we started construction. It's the lowest point on the site. Uh, the mud slab was poured essentially in uh, November of last year. Quickly behind that, we started foundations and pouring the exterior walls to the pump station. Um, the small picture is about 40 days ago, and then the large picture is last week. What you're seeing now um, on the current slide is essentially the three main walls around the pump station going to the first level of the pump station. It's a two-story volume. And uh, the interior wall, there's five of those, divides the intake structure into six individual chambers, which the water filters through, hits the pumps, and then goes vertical. So you're seeing that, and uh, they're continuing that construction. Probably have uh, the rest of the walls probably done within the next two to three weeks. On to our next slide. Um, this is a dropping back a little bit, looking south to the pump station. So you're seeing the north wall of the pump station. And uh, what I wanted to get across in this picture is uh, just uh, how much dirt is being pulled into the site. And if you can see on the, would be the left-hand side of the image, there looks to be a job trailer up on the side. Three feet above that is the final grade. So we've got quite a bit of dirt yet to pull in. If you look at that trailer, that's essentially where the kayak building will go. So we've got about another 10 foot of dirt that we'll be pulling in over the next few months. And go into the channel a bit. Um, quite a lot of activity here in the channel. Again, this is uh, the conveyor inlet, which sits just south of the pump station in between the pump station and the river. So what you're seeing in the foreground on the larger picture is that uh, initial intake structure for the conveyor. That conveyor essentially parallels the river and goes all the way to the upper pond. These are two uh, images that were taken about a month ago, just kind of patched together looking uh, from basically where Lincoln Boulevard connects is the top, top vision, um, going all the way from north, wrapping around to the south. You can see essentially the, the, the extent of the activity that's gone on site. The contractor has um, 
divided the site into about six micro projects. And this is kind of key because we essentially have six different uh, superintendents on site working six individual projects with a superintendent over all of this. We've got one for essentially all site activities, all dirt movement essentially, um, utilities, one for the pump station, one for the conveyor inlet, the channels, and then the building. So it's uh, actually quite interesting to go out there and see every different piece of this coming up together and the coordination that's going into it. The bottom picture is looking on uh, against you from the, the north side of the site, so from Fifth Street, and you're seeing all the grade that's coming up there. Again, on the left side of the site, that is still yet to be elevated about another 10 feet. We are bringing in the import. We have begun to bring the import in from Oliver Park site probably about uh, a month now. We're about 10% through that import, and that'll probably go on for about another four to five months. Jumping to the next slide. This essentially is just the, uh, the recirculating HDPE, high density polyethylene pipe that goes around the, the course. I'll show that a little bit further in, but this piping system essentially recirculates uh, filtered treated water back into the system, which is uh, something different than what we had done in Charlotte where we did not do something like this. Going to the next slide, a little more on the channels themselves. Essentially our first pour on the channel was uh, about 60 days ago. And uh, what we've accomplished over the last 60 days has been four pours. Actually, the fourth pour of the channel is being done this morning. Each pour is uh, about 125 feet wide, 160 feet long, so about 500 cubic yards. And they're building essentially in sections. Each section of channel goes into the expansion joint. And then they come back in a later date and pour the north and south retaining walls. So it's a bit of a highway operation as they're moving forward. So today they're through the fourth pour. The fifth pour of the channel will be the last large section of the bottom pool before we actually get into the, uh, the, the channels themselves and start heading back up to the east. That will happen next week. Moving on to the next slide. This is uh, two pictures, one again about uh, 40 days ago and one from last week. This is the pool um, ramp that comes down from the main pedestrian pad at the, at the main building. And there's essentially a drivable ramp for small vehicles to get inside that uh, lower pond. Another picture looking at the pond back, from, back towards the east. So you can see way in the background some cranes. There's, uh, that's the pump station. And then you're seeing the north wall of the lower pool here. And uh, this again is about a uh, 30 to 40 day old photo. The next one you're going to see the uh, backfill starting to go in. So there's, again, it's a huge dirt operation, and it has to be done in stages because of the way the channels are built. One on top of the other, you have to kind of work from north to south and then from west to east. On the next slide, that's uh, basically turning the camera around and looking back to the west. So you're seeing uh, the framework starting here for slab pour, which is going in this morning. Um, quite a bit of um, reinforcing going in. This particular section is a monument milestone for us because it's the first section that will actually have the Unistrut anchoring system for the future obstacles. On the next slide, a little more detail on that uh, anchoring system. It's essentially a rebar system in itself that's suspended on top of the rest of the rebar that holds up these Unistrut, these uh, metal channels that receive an anchoring system for the, the, uh, the un oh, excuse me, the rapid blocks. In a little more detail on this, and this is why you can, you can, if you've ever seen a rebar being tied and appreciate how much effort goes into it, we have two rebar systems on top of one another, then on top of that, a re, uh, another essentially rebar system being the Unistrut. Just quite a bit of pre-prep activity going in before you even get the concrete into the project. This happens right now in sections. Once we get through the first turn into the channels, that, uni, that Unistrut you see there actually goes the entire length of both channels up to the top pond. It allows essentially the rapid blocks to be configured in, it, in multiple configurations through the operations. The next slide is a test panel to the left showing what that, what that Unistrut will look like once the concrete's poured. Essentially they screed the concrete flush with the top of the Unistrut. Each one of those channels is open that receives an anchoring bolt. That to the right on the picture, essentially those are the rapid blocks and how they would be configured in the channel. This is the next pour. This is the fifth pour of the channel. So we're just above channel from the, uh, the Unistrut. Again, this will be the last large pour, and then we'll start to get into the individual cha channel sections. Going 
Going back to um, the previous slide I had shown indicating the large pipe on site, this is kind of the receiving end on this. You, you can see on the slide the pipe is now inside this, the slab. This piping system starts from the pump station. It is essentially treated with ozone filtered and then there's a residual chlor chlorination in it. It's returned on both sides of the bottom pool to the, un to the slab itself in the bottom pool, so you're recirculating chlorinated water there. This piping also extends up the channels about a third of the way and is actually injected back into the, the system through the sidewalls as well. Our next slide uh, deals with some of the uh, um, vertical features that are um, overlapping the channel. And these, these pictures here are of the bridge abutments for the bridge and ramps going in on the site. This is the, the, the western bridge. So what you're looking at in the foreground on the larger picture, if you were standing at the pedestrian pad from the main building, the, that is essentially the structure for the ramp as well as the first bridge abutment going into the, the competition channel. On our next slide, this is a bit skewed, but uh, this is standing on the very prow of the, uh, the main building, so back to the river, looking at the, uh, the main building. Um, again, it's, the perspective's a little crunched, but uh, what we have here is all the foundations are in, all the grade beams are in, anchor bolts for the uh, vertical steel. Um, we are about 80%, 90% through the rough-in, under slab rough-in for plumbing, electrical. That's uh, scheduled to be done here in the next few weeks, and then slab behind that and structural steel right behind that. A little more detail on the rough end. This was taken from last week, so you're seeing some of that plumbing coming up through the slab, the grease interceptors in, all your plumbing lines. And as I said, uh, we should be completing this portion of the work within the next week, and then the, uh, the actual floor slab within two weeks. And then just quickly, just kind of a forecast of what's to come over the next 30 days. Uh, again, excavation for the site. We've pretty much pulled everything out of the site we're pulling out, so no more unforeseen conditions as far as the, uh, the debris that we found on the site in earlier months. Most of it now is fill. We're bringing that fill in from uh, the Oliver Park site. Again, we're about 10% complete with that. Most of that fill right now is going in to backfill the pump station uh, as well as the, uh, the lower pool, the north and south walls. Utilities, og and &E is running the primary feed. The focus is to get SP4 up and running, which is the relocated existing feed that feeds the irrigation line out there for the system. We're having, shooting to have that done early April and then they'll continue their lines along Phillips and then down 5th Street. HDP channel, that is essentially or channel piping, we talked about that, that's recirculating uh, chlorination piping. The fire line and uh, water lines are about 80% complete, and now we're working on the sanitary sewer system going into the pump station. Main building, we've already talked about that, mostly rough ends and slab and structural steel will start within about 30 to 40 days. Um, the pump station itself, um, Again, we're, we'll have the interior walls done within the next couple weeks. Within a month, we'll be on the second floor slab. So at that point, we're going to be starting uh, our, third, our second level pours. That'll probably take about another three to four months. The uh, structural tubes for the pumps will be on site within a month and a half, and those will be installed. The conveyor system as well, owner procured, will be on site with another, with, uh, I'd say about the end of May is kind of what we're, we're um, focusing there. The channels, we've kind of went through that as well as the bottom um, ramp. The, we'll continue the bridge foundations, um, go on to the inner islands, and we've been coordinating with uh, the boathouse on some issues that uh, they're bringing to it, uh, the stage and some coordinations with structural elements there. And uh, as far as the owner provided pr uh, equipment, uh, filters are on site. They've been on site and are in a container. They've been there for about two months. The conveyor, again, scheduled for mid-May, and the pumps to, pump tubes the end of May. That concludes the uh, update. Take any questions? Just a comment, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for being willing to make Oklahoma City your second home. <laughs> I know you're spending a lot of time here, and it feels like we're in really good hands. This is a complicated, complicated project. I drove by it yesterday, obviously, on the way down to Norman, and it just was a beehive of activity. It is. It's hard to understand it, and uh, just a quick swag of it, but uh, the boathouse um, did install a site camera that uh, I think they're having some connection issues with it right now, but it, they are posting it on their website, so I encourage anyone to, it's, it's a one static, it's, it's a dynamic -ish, um, line, but it's one view, and it's looking essentially from the job trailers out towards the channels, and uh, it runs 24-7, it's an easy way to kind of see what's going on out there. 
You know, reinforced concrete and hydraulics, it just doesn't get much better than that, does it? <laughs> One question, you know, when you have that double reinforced concrete, that's to help minimize any uh, cracking or any problems that may be created. Do you ever develop cracks in that concrete when you pour it in you that? Can't, you can't that? pour concrete without a cracking. That's the nature of the beast. However, the, uh, the system we have is actually an additive called Hycrete, so it makes it a watertight design. Um, we have control joints as well as the reinforcing design to encourage the cracking in certain locations. It will crack. And uh, we have preparations for surface cracking as well, how to deal with that, clean it up. There's sealant that we put in as well. So it is expected to crack. We just try to anticipate where those cracks are. And our Oklahoma red clay helps with that, doesn't it? To some degree. Um, the, we've, got a, we've got a variety of uh, sand to clay out there, and uh, the compaction is critical. We've had high standards for that, and Downey's been very good about keeping that. The, the control of the site has been, has been something to be proud of, I would say. They've, it's been a good job so far. All right, any other questions? All right, thanks very much. And lastly, we have the uh, sales tax collection report from March. Uh, David, you were asking about that last night, and uh, the uh, it, it was a good month for us again. It, it was 3.9% uh, over last year, and year to date, we're just right on target, within a half percent of target of what we thought it would be. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the city manager? All right, we have executive session. We'll be back. Oh, citizens to be heard? Okay. We'll be back after executive session.